friends. We had a nice holy company last night. From Sridhar and Maharaj. Our wife just moved up around the orders. He tell us tonight about some of his personal reminiscences of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. There is a famous saying of Tulushi Dasha, the medieval mystic. The value, the efficacy of the holy company. If you do not have holy company, your delusion will not disturb. If the delusion does not disturb, if you, if you do not talk about God, the delusion will not disturb. And if, you, if the delusion does not disturb, you will not see God. So, holy company has played a vital role in spiritual life. The more we talk about God, the more we remember God. And thus, our mind becomes attuned with God. So, holy company is very important. It is very difficult, as I told you, to have this type of holy person in our midst. But we got this rare opportunity to have him here this few days. So, we are trying to get maximum from him. <laughs> 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 we are trying to get maximum from this holy man. <laughs> So tonight he will tell some of his personal memories about some diary details. Friends, holiness is something which can be ascribed to somebody or which can be felt by others from some object or some individual. I do not know what others feel about it. I don't claim that much of holiness which can transform people. But however, when a younger brother describes an elder brother, naturally there will be some amount of exaggeration there. <laughs> However, that apart, the personalities that we are thinking of were considered to be above ordinary human beings, that there is no abo doubt about it, is my conviction also. Now about them, whenever we speak, we speak with great reservation, thinking that my description does not give the full picture of the personalities themselves. And nobody can understand them unless he has reason to the level to which they belong. So greatness can be understood only by other great men possessing same or similar greatness. We are much below their standard, so therefore our Evaluation of them will be naturally 
limited by our capacities. I have just mentioned in the beginning two of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. One of them, Swami Premananda, was placed in the highest category among the great disciples of Sri Ramakrishna by himself. That category is not our creation, but that is the experience of Ramakrishna himself, the highest group to which only six disciples belonged. However, Swami Premananda, about Swami Premananda, Sri Ramakrishna said, is pure to the very bones. That is the Bengali expression is Har Shuddha Pavitra. Pure to the very bones. And Sri Ramakrishna, when he used to be in high ecstatic mood, in deep samadhi, Ordinary people could not touch him. If they did, Sri Ramakrishna felt extreme pain. But only Baburam, that is Premananda, was permitted to touch the Master in such conditions. That can give you an idea of the greatness of the Swami. My memory about Swami Pramananda is very faint. I just faintly remember that I saw him about a year or so before his passing away. He passed away in 1918, and I may have seen him in 1917 or 16. I don't remember clearly. And about the features also, I have just a faint memory. But I have the great impression that he was held in high esteem by his own brother disciples. And it is known to everybody that he was extremely affectionate towards one and all. That is why he had great influence over the devotees who used to visit Belur Mott and became devotees of the order. Swami Premananda was full of prema or love. Therefore, he was given the name Premananda by Swamiji, perhaps. Swami Vivekananda, Premananda. That was his distinguishing feature. The disciples had some special traits. Every one of them had that. And Premananda can be distinguished by his trait as a man of unbounded love, love for everybody. So the name was aptly given to the Swami, and name is Premananda. 
people felt attraction in at the first meeting as it were he was a big draw among the devotees of ramakrishna for one thing that others were not manifesting their love for them so much but swami premananda was an open book everybody could feel his the touch of his affection the touch of his great love that could not but bind the hearts of the devotees to with him or with the order that was swami premananda from the very beginning after the passing after the after swami ramakrishna ananda who was rendering direct service to sri ramakrishna after his passing away also continued that service as if he was in physical body continued that service in the shrine room where sri ramakrishna was installed there his picture was installed and the service went on like that after his departure from belur mot swami premananda took up that duty the responsibility of serving the master doing puja upasana to him just as swami ramkrishna and they used to do and with his his fervor no less than that of that of ramkrishna and and continued that almost to the last day of his physical life it is said one day swami ji in a highly exalted mood just sitting at the belun mot near the courtyard swami premananda was coming down from the worship room shrine room and he pointed at him and said here is brahman visible realizable immediately and swami premananda when he suddenly he mentioned that swami premananda became deeply absorbed in samadhi there and then standing that because the words created that effect immediately because of his life of purity and great spiritual eminence sri uh, swami premananda was known among the devotees as the mother of the mot mother of the monastery because of his affection and bounded affection towards everybody but my impression is very very just faint i cannot describe him if i do that will be only from what i have studied about him but you don't want that so much so i have to proceed further to other persons this brief reference i have made here as desired by swami chetanananda he told me to just refer to them and then pass on to next that is true <laughs> the next person about whom my memory is equally faint is swami adbhutananda i remember to have seen him 
when he was not well and residing at the Balaram Babu's house I mentioned before, where many of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna used to live occasionally. So that place has been very sacred to us and it has later been accepted as a branch center of the Belur Mot. Now I saw Swami Adbhutananda there, as I told you, and he was not well, seated in a room just as I enter the gate. The, on the left-hand side, there is a room We stayed there. That much I remember and very faintly about his features. Now about Swami Adbhutananda, the name Adbhut means wonderful or uh, what do you call Adbhut? Uh, remarkable. Remarkable, extraordinarily remarkable, Adhut. Now his name was Adhutananda. Why it was given like that? Swamiji himself said that so far as our brother disciples are concerned, we had sufficient, we could say, education. Education, modern education, as well as the ancient scriptural education also. Therefore, we could build up our capacity to understand deep religious thoughts, ideas. But about Swami Advutananda, it is known that he was absolutely innocent of all education. He did not have any education worth the name. Sri Ramakrishna himself once wanted to teach him, though the master was not highly educated himself, he wanted to t teach the disciple just the, uh, the letters at least. He started to teach him letters. Sri Ramakrishna said, you utter the word ka, and he said ka. Sri Ramakrishna laughed and said, you can't pronounce it as ka, you say ka. Then if you add another R to it, what will be there? No change, same ka. So you don't understand anything, you can't learn. Finished. The education stopped there. So he could not even read the letters. And a person without any education, simply by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, could be one of the great saints whom the devotees revered like anything. Now that is a remarkable grace of Sri Ramakrishna. That is why his name was given wonderful or extraordinarily remarkable. Now that was, from that you can understand to what extent Swami Premananda was appreciated by all the brother disciples. I mean, uh, Advutananda was appreciated by the other disciples. Swami Advutananda did not go through any education, that is true. But he had realization through the grace of the Master. One day, a, a pandit, a great scholar, 
was expounding the Upanishads, in the course of which he mentioned a portion where it is stated that just as from a grass, the core of the grass, the core blade can be slowly separated from the stalk. In the same way, the Atma has to be separated from the body-mind complex. When he mentioned this, Swami Advutananda got excited and said, he has explained rightly and slowly repeated to another who was nearby. This is Beautiful explanation, he has repeated rightly. And then that night, he again mentioned that thing and told Swami Shuddhananda, a disciple of Swamiji, you see, the Pandit has rightly described the thing. That means he was comparing that explanation with his own experience. That was Swami uh, Adhutananda. One day, he was a wrestler also. One day he was just resting and fell asleep. The wrestlers, you know, they take hard exercise and naturally feel the, later on some exhaustion. So he was sleeping. Sri Ramakrishna saw him in that condition and said, What is this? You want to realize God, and at this time, early part of the evening, you are asleep. When will you realize God? Swami Advaitananda felt ashamed, begged the pardon of the Master, and since that day, Throughout his life, he never slept a, uh, slept a whole night. Never slept. Any, light, any night he would not sleep at all. Whatever little sleep he could have, that only in daytime, whole night he would be awake and in meditation. From that you can understand the determination with which he proceeded towards the path of God-realization and how literally he followed the advice of Sri Ramakrishna. The instructions are carried out to the letter. That is another instance of his greatness. And later on, even big scholars and seekers of God used to come to him, sit at his feet, and hear profound religious truths from this unlettered person. That was the greatness of Swami Adhutananda. I have not given any exhaustive description which we gathered from our reading or from hearing the other brother disciples, will I pass on to the next person. Third person I refer to is Swami Turiyananda. Swami Turiyananda was a born man of knowledge, as it were, seeker of God from the very birth. Before even coming in contact with Sri Ramakrishna, he was practicing Vedanta and other religious courses with great earnestness. And after coming in contact with Sri Ramakrishna, 
Swami Turiyananda found in the Master a great enlightened soul and dedicated himself at the feet of the Master. He was a dedicated soul from the very beginning, very austere in his habits. There is one mention that he said, I never sat leaning on anything. I always used to sit erect. When I saw him, he was not well. He had diabetes and rheumatism and other kinds of illness. But he was never sitting, just reclining on anything. He used, always used to sit erect like that. The position, the posture of a yogi. And he was of a bright complexion, very fair complexion. And whenever he used to talk, his talk would always concern something about God or about spiritual practice. Whenever he talked, his face was flushed and what tremendous force he had in his words that is unimaginable unless one had heard him directly. One could not understand the depth of it, the force with which he used to say anything, the force that came from the great personality that he had. We naturally felt extremely drawn towards him. And as he was in the house of same Balaram Babu, which was very close to where I lived in my early days, from there I often visited him. Whenever I visited him, I found him seated in that posture, and always talking of something, some God or some something of God or Vedanta or other kinds of practice. Sri Ramakrishna therefore loved him very much and his teachings went on under the feet of the Master with zeal that is uncommon. I give you an, one instance of it. He was thinking of the self which is eternal, which is unconditioned, which has nothing to do with the changes of the body. That was his meditation course. One day he was taking bath in river Ganga along with other bathers there when suddenly people shouted, there's a crocodile, there's a crocodile. So all ran to the land away from water and Swami Turiyananda then his name was Hari. He also, just with that impulse, he wanted to come out of the water. But then he thought, what? I am speaking of Vedanta. I am thinking of the soul which is indestructible. And I am afraid of the crocodile. I am afraid of just the body dying. Again he went into the water and just continued bathing. Of course, crocodile did not do any harm. But see the force of the mind, the strength of mind, that I am, what I am talking, what I am thinking, I must put into practice the same thing. Otherwise it will be hypocrisy. In the same way, he spent most of his life in 
living austerely away from all centers, living on arms only, without keeping any money or any sufficient protection from the hazards of the climates, he would continue as a very ascetic. Once it so happened that he was going from one of our centers, Hardwar, he was going to a place for that kind of austere life, away from all centers, living on arms only. The Swami was the head of the center from where he started. He had great reverence for Santuri Ananda. So he tried to persuade him to keep some money for any emergency. But Swami Turiyananda was unrelenting. He would not agree to that. Then at last he persuaded that at least you take this overcoat. It is extremely cold there. It will give you some protection from the cold. After much persuasion, he accepted that and went to that place where he stayed in a small cottage. And there he found, by putting his hand in the pocket, there was a 10 rupee note. Indian currency rupee, they say, 10 rupee note. Then what he did, he sent that overcoat and the money back. He had agreed to take only that overcoat and instead of that they have put money also there. So he sent back that thing also. That was his way. Extreme austerity. Now throughout his life he used to do that. One day Swami uh, Sri Ramakrishna came to that Balaram Babu's house and inquired uh, from the devotees, where is Hari? That is Swami Turiyanan. Then somebody said, no, before that he inquired at Dakshineshwar, but Hari was not coming to Dakshineshwar for some time. Then a devotee mentioned, Sir, he is now absorbed in meditation and austerity. He has no time to spare. Sri Ramakrishna kept quiet. Next, when he came to Balaram Babu's house, he asked somebody, please inform Hari that I have come here. So somebody went and said, the Master was remembering you, he has come here. Hari came. When he was just, Sri Ramakrishna was staying on the first floor, what you call second floor here in America. There he was, Sri Ramakrishna was staying they are surrounded, he was sitting there surrounded by the devotees and Hari came as he was climbing the steps to go to the second floor. He heard some music. Master was singing a song. He could hear clearly the song was the portion of the relevant portion was this. I speak in Bengali and then give you English translation. Ore kushi lab karish ki gaurab dharana dile ki parish dhote. O kush and lavo, they are the two sons of Ramu, Ramachandra, Sri Ramu. 
addressing them hanuman the monkey god the devotee of uh, ramachandra he was singing it is a country theater without stages or anything they just just play open air so that was the song the in that play this song comes the background is this ram chandra is performing some sacrifice where the horse is let loose and wherever the horse goes to any kingdom the king will either submit to the control of ramachandra or and pay some homage in money or hold that horse there and they, there will be a war a battle fought to release the horse and the king if he is victor if he is defeated then he will submit to the the supremacy of the possessor of the horse that way it is just a horse was roaming and casually came to the hermitage of balmiki the biographer of ramchandra and this love kush they were staying in the ashram of balmiki shita was left in the forest the details you need not remember now i need not narrate now and then they were brought brought up by balmiki they were kshatriya fighters so they caught the horse then a battle started between the soldiers of rama and lava kush on the other side they defeated the soldiers then in larger number the army came with hanuman taking leading part hanuman the disciple of ramchandra the devotee of ramchandra and as hanuman came lava and kush they were young at that time with youthful energy they caught hold of the monkey tied him and brought him to the in the to the presence of sita and said oh mother look what a big monkey we have caught then hanuman he was singing in the play oh kushi love why do you take the credit of binding me can you bind me unless i allow myself to be bound master was singing this song and copious tears were rolling over his cheeks flooding the chest and wetting the ground the carpet beneath so much copious tears you are shedding swami turiyananda at once realized that this is an instruction to him it is meant for him alone he had been thinking by his austere practices he could just have the realization of god by just taking this taking by storm as it will the citadel of god he knew then this is not possible submission to him resignation to him at his feet complete dedication is what is necessary complete surrender and he also began shedding tears thereby that is the story so hari maharaj was of that spirit but sri ram krishna taught him the new lesson 
which he understood and often repeated. Often he used to repeat this. Depend upon the Divine Mother, Mother of the Universe. Unless his, her grace comes, nothing can be achieved. That was the, the sum total of the experience of Swami Turiyananda. But did not, that did not contradict his belief in the Absolute because Sri Ramakrishna was a wonderful harmonizer of all the attitudes and his, his disciples were cast in the same mold. So that was Swami Turiyananda. He was full of fervor for tapasya for austerity, for sacrificing everything for the sake of God-realization. When we used to visit him, many of us belong to the Brahmin caste. The Brahmin caste means the caste which mainly concerns itself with spiritual practices. Of course, that is now not so binding but formerly it was that. They were the priest class. They used to study and teach the scriptures, perform puja sacrifices, services, conducted services. That was their main occupation. Those, so Turiyananda, when he came to know that this group belonged to that caste, he told one day with tremendous force, a Brahmin's life is not for anything else, only for God-realization. A Brahmin's life is for God-realization and that alone and for nothing else. I still remember as if the word is ringing in my ears. It is God-realization alone that matters in life. Nothing else. With tremendous force, he mentioned. In the same way, whenever we went, we found him talking with all fervor about this Vedanta and other things. One of the devotees, he used to come regularly and Swami Turiyananda will find great joy in just discussing with him about this high philosophy of the Absolute. What is the name of the devotee? That I don't know. I, I was young at that time, so did not care about the name. He did not make any inquiry about the name. But we saw him that way. In that way, whenever we visited, we found he was always giving greatest emphasis on the life of austerity for God-realization. By the way, it should be remembered that life of austerity has no meaning for as itself. It is not much. It, is, it, is, it has no meaning if there not be any association or zeal for God-realization. It is a means only and not an end. Austerity by itself was condemned by Sri Ramakrishna. He said God-realization is the ultimate goal and austerity to some extent may be helpful. I mention this and lest you think that, he, that Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples gave much stress on austerity itself. No. Swami Vivekananda also once mentioned while he was going to Amarnath, the temple, uh, the cave temple of Shiva in the Himalayas. There he saw sadhus, the monks, almost in bare body. In tremendous, it was extremely cold. It is extremely cold place even now when rivers freeze 
and every not a tree was there because of the extreme cold. We had, I had the occasion of visiting once that place. So in that place, they were in bare body. Sadhus were in bare body, almost naked, going. Swami Vivekananda began to criticize that this kind of austerity has no meaning. But afterwards he said, but some amount of austerity is necessary in life for the, for the seekers of God. Otherwise they will indulge in luxury and they will be thereby say, taken away from the path of God. Some amount of austerity is necessary. The idea is that simple living without indulging in the pleasures of the body, a man should remain with constant attention towards the ultimate goal, God-realization, and austerity as a means may be followed to some extent. That is all. Now about Samiturianananda, I was talking, I am digressing now. Sumitvari was always austere in his habits, everywhere. I told you about the story of the crocodile, then another story in that, this connection, another event. When he was in that place of the sadhana practice, in the Himal not in the Himalayas, it was in the plains, but a place considered holy and very convenient for life of spiritual practice. There he was there, then at that time he heard people shouting that there was a tiger. So instinctively what he did, the door was simply a cottage has no protection practically. There was a, just a door. There was nothing to close the door. So he closed the door and put a stone for protection so that the door cannot be opened. Of course, it's a flimsy protection, nothing very safe. And then he laughed that I am still thinking of protecting myself, as if the Divine Mother is not protecting me. He removed the stone. Of course, nothing happened. What I say is how his mind worked. That's kind of practice and profession. Completely went hand in hand without contradicting one each other. That is what is important. He practiced what he thought as means for God realization. Whole life was like that. In this connection, I should not fail to remember one point. He had so much control over the body and the mind that he could do anything with it as it, as it were. Nothing could be, could go against his command. He used to say, when you sit for meditation, write on the door of your mind, no admission. No other thought should enter there, as if it can be done by anybody and everybody. It is not easy, but for him it was natural. When no other thought is allowed to enter, they could not. That was the idea. Once, when he had diabetes, there was a carbuncle on his back. Doctor said it had to be it had to be operated. 
It's that, that portion, the flesh will have to be affected, flesh portion will have to be removed. It was a big operation. So the doctor told him, Sir, I shall put you under general anesthesia so that you will not feel the pain. Swami Turiyananda said, Why? You just tell me when you are going to do it. I shall take my mind away from that portion of the body. The doctor simply did not believe it. But he said, All right, when he is insisting, did not like to be put under anesthesia. All right, I shall begin. And then when he will feel pain, he will naturally ask me to just uh, anesthetize him. So we started the operation. And Swami Turirananda remained quiet, calm, as if nothing has happened. <coughs> as if the operation was going on in, on some other's body. Then when the operation was completed, the doctor said, operation is over. Oh, is that so? Very good. <coughs> doctor simply felt uh, amazed that how can a man bear so much pain? Next day or the day after that, the doctor came again to dress that wound. And in the course of his dressing, he found a portion of the flesh, just a small portion, should be removed. So he put his knife and removed that portion. And Swami Turiyananda got started. What is this? He says, Doctor said, Sir, you bore all the pain yesterday, and today I have done only a little pin prick. But why did you feel the pain? Swami Tariyan said, he did not tell me that you are going to do that. Then I would have removed my mind from that person. See, what amount of control a person like that can have over his body and mind. These are two illustrations worth remembering. And I see my time is up, so I cannot proceed further. Tomorrow you will tell Mahapurush Maharaj. Today you say a few words about M, your first in your English. Not today, now okay. it is. No. No. <laughs> All right, we are very thankful to Swami to tell his reminiscences about Premananda, Arbutananda, and Swami Tijanam. Tomorrow night also we shall hear some more about the Jari Good night. Thank you, everybody.